Aussies love Fiji. And what's not to love? The country is an archipelago of more than 300 islands with tree-lined beaches, crystal clear water, coral reefs, and of course, that incredible hospitality. The two countries also share important trade and investment ties. And Fiji is one of our closest neighbours. At a hotel in Nandi, Pacific neighbours are coming together in unusual resort attire to share their knowledge about a vital agricultural industry. This is the inaugural Pacific Islands Beekeeping Congress. So we slowly put this back. And in the middle of all the buzz is the man affectionately nicknamed Queen Bee by some, Australian scientist and academic Cooper Shooton. I, I fell in love with beekeeping. I was um, at high school, I got a job with a local beekeeper and I was basically trying to help mum pay the bills. I fell in love with you know how fascinating they are and fell in love with being in the forest. And then from there, when I was doing my honours degree, I really realised how amazing beekeeping is and it has the ability to be able to generate income for people without damaging the environment. So I was able to connect that love of the environment with helping people. That's what this Congress is all about, improving the profitability and productivity of beekeeping in the region. Okay. And this wax has been melted up to 68 degrees. It's the culmination of a project funded by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research and led by Southern Cross University. Yeah, you can see the cracks oh, okay. in the middle. Yeah. A project that rolls out research and training in everything from biosecurity and breeding to livestock management and marketing. Bravo, bravo. Smoke it, whatever, you leave it. And empowers the local industry, especially women and young people, to lead the way. Leave it, leave it. Time again. Four minutes. And this isn't about handing out, it's about helping out, it's about working with people overseas and we've seen beekeeping programs happening in many developing countries and they just don't work. The research that we've done shows if you give 100 beekeepers some beehives and a week of training and come back in two or three years, you'd be lucky to have one or two of them left. So our research is really trying to understand process to actually make these programs sustainable so that when the program ends, the beekeeping industries have got a lot more strength and sustainability to grow themselves. On Fiji's third largest island, Tavuni, is one very gutsy apiarist who has taken extraordinary steps to grow her business. Atro Nisha is the first woman to be named the country's beekeeper of the year. Today, taking on a fast rising river with her husband to add another wild hive to her collection. Normally, it's very hard for us to catch the queen. Oh. So we were luck very lucky to get it today. You don't give up easily, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> and did you think twice about walking back over? Because I'm like yelling, don't come over. Don't yeah. come. And you just, no, this is what it's like uh, to work Like, uh, I know about this river. You know. So it's not that deep. So I, man I can manage to You can manage it, it. yeah. OK. Maybe not me, though, hey? Yeah. <laughs> The former vegetable grower got into bees in 2015 after becoming captivated by the busy creatures during a week-long Australian-funded training course which finished with a box, tools, but no bees. I went through agriculture to ask for the bees. They were taking too long, so I decided myself if I can get a wild one. So I went to find a wild hive, and then my husband and I, we found a hive. Both of us tried to remove that wild hive and place it into the box. It was very difficult. We had uh, done it three times. The third time, first time we did it, the bees went out. <laughs> Second time we did, the same thing happened. And then the third time, then I was able to put the bees into the hive. They were stable in the hive. Atrol now has around 160 hives, crossing more than raging rivers to secure them. Some are very high, but still, if we want that hive to be brought home to increase our hives, I have to do that. I have to remove the higher ones, so I have to, we have to climb up <laughs> and then get those hives down. How many trees have you climbed? Uh, I have climbed a few, but uh, houses also, houses on top of the roofs. She's also branched out into box making with her husband. 
And now this family business has provided enough income to kickstart another. Recently, I managed to open a barber shop for my son. It is one of the professional barber shop in, uh, in the area. Her work is just to lay eggs. Atril is now sharing what she's learned through training and experience with other, mainly female beekeepers, to help make them more profitable. It was my passion that one day I might teach other beekeepers. In Tavuni, there are about 20 beekeepers, but the management and information they got about bees, it is very low. She does not stink. Sharing knowledge about how to get the most out of beehives is also a priority of the Australian-led research project. You cannot expect your bees to be healthy, happy and productive if you just stick them in a paddock. Just like any other type of livestock, you've got to pay attention to their genetics, their nutrition, different technologies, the markets that are out there in order for them to be productive businesses. This is something local beekeepers need to pay particular attention to. While the model may be oversized, the destructive varroa mite is a very real problem most of the apiarists here are dealing with, including mother and daughter team Milikera and Elena McDonald, who got into beekeeping two years ago. We may not be able to eradicate, but we're able to control. That's what I'm learning and what we can do to control. Until 2022, Australia was free of Varroa. Since then, when it's been detected, thousands of hives and feral colonies have been destroyed in an effort to eradicate it. But in Fiji, the parasite is endemic, spreading across the country after being discovered in 2018, killing colonies. And what do they actually do to the bees and the hive? They're basically feeding on what we thought. We used to think that it was on the blood of the bee, but new research has come out showing that they're actually feeding on the fat body of the bee. So detecting the mites, which are the size of a sesame seed, early is the key. I've double checked that we don't have the queen bee on there. So we're going to collect half a cup of bees. Essentially, this method is pretty much free, right? It's just soapy water. What are you seeing at the moment? At the moment, I'm seeing lots of little varroa mites falling off those bees. I'm going to remove these bees out of there. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So 16 over 300 is 5%. So that's a 5% mite loading. So what would you do? I'd be treating that colony. I'm still putting the same amount of treatment in. There's two per brood box, but I'd have one, two, three, four across here. Finding the right chemical or non-chemical treatments to take on Varroa is part of the research and training being rolled out in Fiji, which can potentially turn students into teachers. It's a fascinating site. We've got a lot of lessons that we could learn from, you know, our nearest neighbours in lots of ways when it comes to practically managing a lot of these pests and diseases. These guys are living and breathing it every day. Their bottom lines are dependent on it. Really just going back and forth like this. As the industry learns how to manage what's already in Fiji, steps are also being taken to keep out what isn't. Australia is helping local biosecurity officers set up a national pest surveillance program to catch exotic pests coming in from other countries. Early detection is going to be really helpful. There's also all sorts of other pests and diseases and most people are not talking about them. For example, tropolalaps mites. Go and talk to any of the beekeepers in Papua New Guinea, they're having a, a hell of a time. It breeds really fast, so it multiplies twice as fast, it spreads the same viruses as, um, as Varroa does and obviously, it, yeah, it's killing colonies very fast. If you start seeing anything running around that frame, very tiny mites, um, they're moving very fast, then that's something to take notice of. For the biosecurity officers on the front line, it's the next phase of their training, which comes with a sense of pride and a lot of responsibility. From the time I've been uh, in my primary and my high school, this is my dream job. At this level, I get to save the people of Fiji here. And main thing is protecting Fiji's uh, uh, ecosystem from uh, exotic pests and diseases. And is this not just about protecting Fiji? 
Absolutely. So it's about protecting Fiji beekeepers, but it's also about protecting beekeepers all around Fiji. We don't want pests and diseases spreading all around industries around other countries, including Australia. Because from producing honey to pollinating other crops, there is a lot to protect. The Australian honeybee industry back at home is worth about $254 million, but what people don't see a lot of the time and talk about is the contributions to our food and nutrition security. It's a $14.2 billion industry, and that report was about nine years old, so it's actually a lot more than that these days. Someone in Fiji who understands the value of the industry is Nilesh Kumar, who is the president of the country's beekeepers association. He took it up as a hobby in 2009, after being introduced to bees by a friend. What's that? This is your office? Yeah. Do you like coming out here because you just get away from it all? Yeah, away from everybody. Yeah. When I go and walk in the yard, like it's peace and quiet. It gives me happiness to see the bees, how they walk, and the different types of jobs they do in the hive especially when the honey season kicks off. This frame is ready to harvest. Can you see it's completely yes. full? His passion for these hard workers prompted a controversial career change. I'm looking after them and they are also looking after me. And how well have they looked after you so far? Like, I resigned my full-time job because I could earn enough to look after myself. And you were a teacher before, hey? I was a school teacher, yes. What did your family think when you started this? Ah, uh, they were not happy. <laughs> Why was that? Because nobody wanted me to leave my formal job and do beekeeping yeah. and farming. But they've come round to the idea as he's turned his hobby into a commercial business, expanding from six to 400 hives and ticking off life goals along the way. I had a dream that I want to build a house I had enough money and I built my house in Nandy and now I'm planning to buy a new vehicle. So maybe very soon I'll have a new vehicle and it's all the income I'm getting from the farm, like pineapple and honey farm. That income has taken some big hits though. Last year he lost 50% of his hives when varroa mites got in. While he says he's ready for that pest now, there are some things that are harder to prepare for. We have cyclone, drought, and a long period of rain. And 2016, when we were hit by Cyclone Winston, it was category five cyclone. I lost about 40% uh, of my hives, not during the cyclone, but after the cyclone, because there was a dead of nectar and all those things. Keeping bees well fed so that they keep on feeding us is one of the challenges for local beekeepers and industry leaders like Nilesh and Cooper, as increasingly unpredictable weather events wash away natural food sources. The honey flows used to be on time, the rainfall used to be on time, but it was much more predictable and it's just not the way that it is today. But now he's found his golden ticket, Nilesh isn't about to give it up because of climate change. It's just a part of life. We know that if this cyclone, we will lose certain percent because beekeeping is a passion for me. So even if it's 100 percent, I'll again start with it. And if you want to check the temper, this is what you do. Luckily, the livestock he works with these days is more laid back than the local bees the industry has relied on in the past. It's not stinking, no stink. So you can say, they are very good temper. They were very aggressive bees. Sometimes it's very hard for the farmers to go and manage that. So for that reason, like sometimes the farmers are not really going and inspecting their beehives. This is a queen that was donated by Australia, ICR. So this one has a F1 queen. After 30 years without any new genetics, last year saw the arrival of 20 Italian queen bees from Western Australia which Nilesh is now helping to breed up and distribute, while also teaching others how to do the same. Like this one has one, this one has four, this one has two. Whether they're more productive is still to be seen, but either way, he's keen to take what his family packages for the domestic market to the next level. 
the future is like it's growing and we know it will grow. Ten years back, we were importing honey. Now we are, have enough to supply our local market and ready to export. Producing a broad range of honey to appeal to different tastes and budgets is all part of the multi-layered project Cooper Shooten is leading. And there's plenty of work to be done. If you walk into most supermarkets in Fiji, what do you see when it comes to honey? You see a number of different products, but you really just don't have the diversity that we get yeah. at home. We take it for granted. When you look at the shelves back at home, you can see all sorts of different types of honey. You've got low GI honey these days, you've got yellow box honey, you've got manuka honey, you've got creamed honey. Here you really don't see that diversity, and yet there's lots of diversity in terms of the floral resources and the flowers that the bees are feeding on. How many people are going to spend, you know, 20 plus dollars on honey? Yeah, that's it, that's exactly right. And most households are not consuming honey. They simply just can't afford to consume it. And do people trust honey? This is a big challenge for a lot of beekeeping industries and, you know, there's, we, we do a lot of uh, marketing and, and support and, and importantly, quality assurance programs in the beekeeping industry back at home to ensure that when you're buying honey, it's pure honey. Um, we need a lot more of that in the Pacific to, you know, encourage households and people to trust the products that they're buying. This is the cheapest way to look how humid it is. Back at the Congress, as a selection of local drops are put to the test, now the first thing that's going to go into your pot, it's going to be beeswax. Next door, beekeepers and a last minute student are also learning that the little livestock can produce far more than honey. Have you made these sorts of products before? No. 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 It's the first that's time. why we are learning here. Yeah. So will you go home now and, and practice? And practice? Yeah. Yeah. Blend. What do you Let the scale kind of balance out a little bit. Yeah. Okay. As Canadian expat turned local beekeeper Karen Mills shows how to make body care balms out of a byproduct. Don't trust me. 288. No, okay. 288. Corey? Yeah. Uh, what are we going for? 288? Yeah. Oh, 290. 290. Just a bit over. So do a lot of beekeepers in Fiji actually value add? No, it's something new okay. that we've been really trying to promote over the last couple of years. Uh, uh, many beekeepers uh, discard their beeswax and they don't really understand the value of beeswax. But how much value can it add? Yes. Well, you can actually double the value of your product or more. And while Atrul Nisha is helping run this course, She's also learning what to do with her own beeswax, which she has stored when she gets home. I am learning every day. In this Congress, I have met a lot of people, so it's a big help for me. So you're going to be the um, beekeeper of the year next year too? Uh, maybe we'll give it to somebody else. <laughs> with a few crores of uh, local drones. Right, right. And this is like entirely right. the genetic from this high volume. As for the Australian scientist coordinating many of the lessons over the last few years, well, he's reluctant to take too much of the credit for what's been achieved, but while there's still work to do, he's pretty satisfied with the outcomes so far. I'm looking forward to having you guys come and stay at my house sometime. Oh, yeah. It'll be really fun. What makes you smile when you look around? All my beekeeping friends that I've been working with for the last four years and they're really confident working their beehives and they're generating more money from their beekeeping and they're, they're selling that honey and the money that they're making, they're putting a roof over their head, their kids are going to school um, and an industry that has a vision for the future.